think we, haha, ha. I'll put, I'll put <laughs> not to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if, you have, if you're not pretty, you have to have at least a pretty background. <laughs> Very good. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'm Sharon Kennedy, and uh, I'm a curator of education here at History Nebraska in Lincoln, Nebraska. And our purpose is preserving the past, building the future. Our niche is that we collect, preserve, and share Nebraska's history. And I just want to say I'm honored to be here today to moderate. So welcome to Vision Makers Media, Media's first online Indigenous Film Festival. Vision Maker Media is a native nonprofit located in Lincoln, Nebraska, in case you didn't know, in the United States. Vision Maker Media empowers and engages Native people to share stories. Vision, Vision Maker Media envisions a world changed and healed by understanding Native stories and the public conversations they generate. Reaching the general public and the global market is the ultimate goal for the dissemination of Native produced media that shares Native perspectives with the world. VMM continues to showcase the most compelling Native stories for public broadcasting on local PBS stations and online. Today, I will be moderating the Q&A for the Blackfoot, excuse me, Blackfeet Flood with producer directors Torsten Shellstrand and Benjamin Shores. Major festival sponsors include the Lincoln Journal Star, Woodland Voices, Flutes, Lux Center for the Arts, Native American Calling, National Native News, Indie Giffy, or IE Modern Indigenous Music, NV1, FNX First Nations Experience, NET Nebraska's PBS and NPR stations, Woods Charitable Fund, Humanities Nebraska, the Lincoln Community Foundation, Lincoln Arts Council, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Cooper Foundation, the Reese Foundation, the Cherokee Nation Film Office, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And we have two very special guests with us, and perhaps a, a third will be joining us a little bit down the road. Torsten and Ben, I wondered if you would take just a few minutes to say a few words about yourselves and perhaps how this film came to be. Sure, I'm uh, happy to jump in. And Sharon and everyone at Vision Maker, we just uh, thank you for the opportunity. We never get tired of discussing this story um, and we're always glad to be able to share it with broader audiences. Um, this story uh, started with, um, well, it started in the 1960s. I don't know how far back we should go, but with the flood of 1964, um, it's an important piece of Blackfeet history uh, and modern Blackfeet history. It's also a story, not just of history, but of built environment and understanding how that built environment and the natural environment collided catastrophically on June 8th, 1964. We got interested in this story originally because the coverage of the 1964 floods won a Pulitzer Prize for a small newspaper in Montana. And that newspaper did a phenomenal job of covering the floods within their community. That newspaper was on the western side of the Rocky Mountains, which of course formed the Continental Divide. And they uh, had almost no coverage of what happened on the eastern side of the Continental Divide, home to the Blackfeet Nation. On the western side, uh, no one died in the floods. There was a tremendous damage to those communities, those primarily, predominantly white communities. But on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains, 31 people died, um, several of whom uh, their bodies have never been recovered. And this Pulitzer Prize uh, did not reflect the full uh, tragic nature of what happened on June 8th, 1964. And for us, I think it began as an attempt to remedy that. Um, and gradually it, it grew from an oral history project to a project that is about, I think, um, family and community and persistence and um, just a, 
uh, a change, a dramatic change in, in the culture and life on, on the Blackfeet Reservation. And uh, 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 I'm Torsten, uh, and uh, I guess I, th the things I can add are Ben grew up on the edge of the Blackfeet Reservation, so he knew the area and some of the history. Um, I, I did not. I grew up in Sweden, which is a long ways from the Blackfeet uh, Nation. Um, but when Ben told me about this story, I, it was immediately compelling to me. And both because the story itself is compelling and the, the failure of our profession, both, both Ben and I come out of newspaper journalism to, um, to do the job we're supposed to do, which is to record history as it's happening. Um, and then also I think the, the reasons for that failure is, um, I, I think there's a blind spot in so much of our media and particularly in journalism to native communities. Um, and I think back in 64, it didn't fit with what uh, the coverage ought to be or what, what, what journalists thought of the coverage as being. And, and the, the truth is, I'm not sure when we started the story, it, I think it still wasn't necessarily on the radar of media and storytelling. So as Ben said, it started as a oral project, oral history project, and then Vision Maker came in and kind of believed in us um, and as my experience with Vision Maker has always been, has encouraged us to consider how the story was told and through which voices and with whose um, kind of guidance. And that's when we started making connections with people on the reservation. Brooke Sweeney, who is a Blackfeet filmmaker, um, Leilani Upham, who may be joining us here in a bit, who is a journalist uh, who grew up on the Blackfeet Reservation. Um, and uh, then George Son, who was at Vision Maker at the time, who's been a, a guide for a long time. And, and so, the, 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 and that's important to note because neither Ben nor I are native. And that, that is um, potentially a troublesome, it has been in the past, a troublesome place to be. And we can only uh, assume so much understanding of the stories we're telling. And then the, the next step was that the community, many, the families, many of the families in the community really became the next people who were our guides through this, the people whose stories we were telling. And I think it became very apparent that we were collaborators in storytelling. We were not kind of extracting a story. That was very important that we not do that. And then when this became clear that this was going to be more than a series of oral histories or short films, then ITBS stepped in and they were our next guys who really helped us become filmmakers um, because we needed some help. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and they were amazing. Um, you know, there's financial support, but there's the other kind of support you get as you put all these pieces together and as the stories change and as you try to um, it, it just kind of make this something that is a compelling story that is um, it, the only way we can return the gift of a community allowing us in and into the story is by trying to make a beautiful story in return, a beautiful film in this case. And all of those people, all of those people and organizations were, uh, so it feels a little funny that just Ben and I are sitting here, to be honest. Right. So Ben, do you, do you want to just say a few words about your childhood and perhaps your, your love for this land? Um, sure. Uh, to the extent that it has a bearing on, on this story, I won't uh, take us down any rabbit holes of my youth. Uh, that's uh, mostly documented in police records um, that you can find about. Um, but uh, yeah, so my, my, my parents were from the Midwest and they moved to Montana about uh, a, ha uh, a half century ago. And so my dad uh, was actually an attorney who represented um, low-income people on the Blackfeet Reservation in the late 1960s and 1970s. That pertains to the story in and of the, the fact that people still remembered my father and um, most people remembered him fondly. And that was a way that it helped build um, connections. And I didn't grow up on the reservation, um, 
but I grew up on the town that, that borders the eastern edge of the Blackfeet Reservation, uh, which has a large uh, Blackfeet population. And so many of my friends growing, growing up were Blackfeet. And um, I was, uh, you know, as, you are, as one is as, as a child, uh, did not understand uh, cultural issues and uh, just um, how those were shaping the lives around me. So I was very excited. I've, I've been gone from Montana for about two decades, 20, 25 years now. And so I was very excited to go back and tell a story of this community and to rediscover um, people who I thought I knew uh, two decades before. Um, and I mean, and then you, you get to film and work in one of the most beautiful places on earth. Um, and it's just a fantastic place to be, very welcoming uh, community. Um, and so it was hard to call it work sometimes when I, I felt like we were just traveling around, beautiful country, having great conversations. Um, and uh, that was my, my connection. The, the connection to Butch's story, um, Butch's story is his story. I saw some resonance in terms of how do you come back to a place that you've been away from uh, for so long and what draws us back to those places? Uh, and can we really, you know, it's been stated much more eloquently uh, by others, but can, we, can you really go home again? Uh, is there a path to that regardless of, of who you are? Um, is there a way to, to find yourself back in those places? And so that's what, what drew me to that story. And then a sense of um, just justice of um, these people are, are becoming lost to, to history and we want to record those stories before they're gone. And that's, that's, that's what we love to do is to help people preserve stories. Very good, great, thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's what resonated with me immediately was um, the, the, that, that sense of place, what, what we identify with, um, you know, what makes a place, um, that, that sense seems to kind of run through um, this, this film in a real strong way. And, and I'll just say, I have a few, um, a few questions, but to our viewers out there, feel free at, at any point, um, as you saw, um, ask questions, throw them in the chat box or the Q&A, and we will, um, we will we'll be happy to take those questions. Uh, to me, uh, it, this story is about how, you know, two different people responded to this really horrific, uh, devastating flood, how, how one family felt this need to stay. Um, I think Eloise England said it, you know, something to the effect of, uh, we, were, we had too much to put back together again. We had too much to do to get depressed. Um, and then we have Butch and, and how, how, how a 14-year-old handles the loss of family and um you know and and goes on you know it's just is really hard to imagine and um and his way was to leave and and not come back and i think that's for at least for a very long time and and i think that's really interesting how we deal with um when our sense of home and our sense of place is is suddenly gone, you know what do we what do we do? And and so I, I felt that that story was told in in a you know really that those two stories, those two very different stories, um, were told in a in a really wonderful way. And then I just and then just how it it all comes together. Um, you know, also is, is really strong. I guess um, one thing I, I'm also interested in is that is, and this, maybe that connection of flood, I mean, this is an actual flood event that happened in our lifetime. Um, there's that 
there's a lot of stories of flood and I, I think Torsen, having worked in Alaska, you're probably familiar with some of those, but there's a lot of, it seems a common story, a common theme in, in indigenous stories too. And I, um, I didn't know if, you know, if you wanted to comment on that, that, um, well, maybe why that is, and maybe, you know, just what, what that flood, maybe that environmental, we were talking about the built environment and the natural environment or what, um, what the flood might represent, uh, what, what people do in response to environmental disasters, what we've done, especially native people in, in our history in, um, of trauma and, and environmental um, upheaval. Any thoughts about that? Well, certainly floods are, show up in a lot of cultures' stories because they're so terrifying. That, you know, this, and, um, and I think that it's almost impossible, now maybe this is because I majored in English in college, but it's impossible not to think of it as a metaphor, you know, the inundation of a people and whether that, that, that the flood that comes through that's devastating is literally water as it was in this case. And, and by the way, water that in, we struggled with the idea with the wording of that. Do we call it a natural disaster? It was a huge snowpack year and a very unusually warm and early and big rain in June that, and that helped us. But on the Birch Creek, the one where Butch and um, Smokey and their families were, there was also an earthen dam that was poorly built and poorly maintained. So is that a natural disaster or not a natural, you know, it, it, we struggled mm -hmm. with what to call it. But there was, you know, the, the, it, it's, now this is not for me to, to paint down over it, but it was hard for me not to think of it as a metaphor for the inundation of culture, the, the colonization of peoples, like a flood of nature that came and, and moved people off the land and moved people away from their families and, and all of that. I don't, I think I would be a little hesitant to put those words in Smokey or Butch's. I, I don't know whether they think of it that way or not, but my little English major gerbil running in my head had a hard time not thinking of this as, as a, somehow a metaphor for that. I would have, I don't think we put that in there explicitly because I think it would have been forcing our interpretation onto a story. Um, but but I, I think your question, this is the first time I think I've mentioned that because your question made me, it's been in my head the whole time. Yeah. I think um, if I could jump in there and add uh, a, maybe a little bit to what Torsten said, um, this this uh, flood and this emergence of this tragedy is sort of the um, a smaller part of this bigger story. So we didn't want to make a story just about a tragedy um, because that too often has been glorified in, in native storytelling. We wanted to make a, a story about what happens after. Um, but to do that, it necessitated that we understood what came before. And we understood why uh, families historically lived along the rivers uh, for shelter and water, places that didn't have um, basic um, necessities. Um, it's, it's the collapse of the dam is, is uh, and I'll pick up on the metaphor, Torsten, is really a failure not just of a dam, but a failure of a system, a government system to first of all provide appropriately, and then in the aftermath of this tragedy, to not provide it at all for a 14-year-old like Butch, who is just untethered, no support, no payment, no, no funding. Um, and, uh, and, and many of the people who lived in those communities said, look, if you want a house, you need to move into town. You need to give up this uh, rural way of life. You need to move where we have schools, where we have electricity, where we have sewer systems. And that's an incredibly um, difficult choice. And so uh, both these two stories reflect that tension, I think, between Eloise and, and Butch's approach to this. 
and how do we deal with trauma? Do we, do we cling to the place where this was and uh, hold tight to these memories or do we flee from them? And I think uh, regardless of what your approach is to how we deal with and process tragedy, we found that even the people who stayed and lived, you know, just feet from where this tragedy unfolded, still had created this emotional distance between event and were had never been uh, able to to converse about what that tragedy had meant in their lives. And so many times we went into to homes in, invited, uh, and um, people said, "I've never talked about this." Even the people who hadn't fled from that and lived with it for so long, mm -hmm. it was just so painful uh, for them to have those conversations. And so we were really honored. Um, and I think as outsiders, we had a bit of an advantage uh, in that we were able to come in and ask questions that had been dormant in those communities for, for many years. Uh, and that was, a, that was a great blessing for us. Mm -hmm. And it really was striking how often we heard that people, we originally the oral histories were with elders who had um who were young adults when this happened and it was uh even i picked up on how often we heard the same thing i've never told anybody about this i mm -hmm. my grandchildren don't know about this and and there was a sense that the community knew that this had happened obviously it's not a secret but there were a lot of details and a lot of who was involved that hadn't been and, and as Ben said, one of the one of the privileges I think you have as an outsider maybe is that no one expects you to know anything. So we were it was almost like we were given permission to ask these questions. Um, that um, that no, we did it careful. Isn't that nice, Torsten? Where we live, we work in a profession where our ignorance is a gift. Um, <laughs> It's perfect. That's why I'm such a perfectly good at this, is because ignorance is my specialty. Yeah, um, but it, but it, but it, it was striking, and how some people wanted to talk about it, and many of these elders also were, they understood the importance of getting this recorded and doing it. And then, then of course, there's the whole issue: what do you do with that footage? And you can you can present it to the tribe, but to whom in the tribe do you present it? And how careful are, is it, whose job is it to um, make, kind of decide who has access to this? Because I don't think we can, we ought to just throw this footage out there and let anyone who wants to use it for anything they want. And that's, um, I, I don't feel like we've solved that problem at all. I don't think anyone else has either. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, so. Uh, Good. Well, yeah, so I'm curious then, um, the, the 50th, commemor 50th year commemoration then that, that happened, um, did, ha was that planned within the community and you were able to, how, how did that all come about, that, that piece? Because that seemed really significant to a lot of people perhaps who hadn't talked about it, who hadn't. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. yeah, that um, that is a community gathering that is held on the, on the Blackfeet Reservation um, each spring. And we attended several of those, including the 50th anniversary, but we were also there, I think, for the 49th and the 48th. And wow. we, um, you know, we went through all the steps in the process of getting approval from tribal members, ensuring that people were comfortable with us being there and filming. Um, and um, it, it was very poignant to be there at, at the 50th because these, uh, these tribal members who were just young uh, at the time of the flood and now are, are growing old and some of them, you know, uh, no longer able to tell their stories. So it was really important. We, we saw several other people who we interviewed uh, of course, Eloise and, and many other friends who passed away uh, before the film was finished. And that uh, creates a special bond for us to try to make sure that we, we get that, um, that story right. Okay, wonderful. We've got a question here from Randy. Was it a process for survivors opening up with their stories since they've been so quiet about it over the years, or were they forthcoming right away? I think um, 
uh, some were forthcoming right away, but I think there was a natural process of checking us out, um, but, but uh, uh, these are these are delicate stories and painful stories, and I don't think um, part of the reason they hadn't been told was because there hadn't been someone who's willing, someone from the outside like us or from the inside maybe who'd been, who felt like it was, they could sit still with them long enough. And so there was very much a relationship building process. Some of it formal, we asked permission from the tribal council and and some of it was less formal, visiting with elders and family members who, uh, you know, it seemed natural that they would take some time to decide to what extent they wanted to speak with us. And um, that, that this was not a film to be made in a hurry. This was not a, it, it would have been a terrible mistake for us. And you can ask anyone who worked with us, we are not people who were in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> but much of the frustration of some people sometimes. But but I think it would have been a terrible mistake to go in and kind of do uh, show up for ten days and film like crazy and then leave and make a film because we there was a process of not only people accepting us but also us developing enough understanding so that we were um, we could at least be respectful of the stories. To, yeah. So how long did it? take you from from beginning to end i believe it was about six years um now along the way we created a series of um short films as well which are up on pbs indies and if you put in pbs indies the blackfeet flood you'll see some of the other stories out there we did uh you know dozens of interviews and from those interviews we tried to find a narrative that we thought was both compelling and representative. Um, I'm convinced we still have our blind spots. We are not immune to uh, any of these uh, issues that all of us face. I'm convinced that if you know two different filmmakers um, were to look at all this footage, or a dozen different filmmakers were to look at all this footage, you'd come up with a, do a dozen different stories. Um, but we wanted to move slow to try to get it right. Um, and that meant that sometimes we talk to people initially and they wouldn't, they'd say, well, I'm not very comfortable. Or, or usually it would be more like, uh, well, let's, how about next year or next week or, or whenever. Um, but we often found that those people had some of the most powerful stories to tell. Uh, on PBS Indies, there is a, um, an interview between an uncle and his niece, and the uncle rescued his niece from the flood water, and he didn't tell her for 50 years. He never said, hey, I was the one who carried you out of the flood water waters, until they sit down next to each other, and uh, we intrude and into that conversation, and they're able to talk to each other, and we are just able to listen to that conversation. And um, that was, a, I think, a very important moment for both of them to um, have this reason, this impetus to have a conversation that he had withheld for a half century. And so those were just incredibly powerful moments to, to witness. Indeed. And, and again, I'll just invite our viewers, feel free to, to ask more questions. And, and, but on that subject, you know, I think that's something that I watched the film a couple of times and on the point that, that I think got me both times, I just uh, were so emotive were those, those moments of, of community and family and love. And, and I think, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's that point where the two little kids are on the horses and they're riding, you know, in this huge, I mean, it's just, I, I have to say, I, I really think that storyline came through loud and clear that, that for, for Butch, that's what made home home. You know, he, he, he was a, amongst people who, um, you know, had this great, great sense of love and community. And that, 
you know, it's just one of those universal human uh, stories that really um, I commend you on on that. Um, extremely powerful. Steve, and I'll just Steve ask our viewers powerful. if there's anything, any other, if they felt as strongly about <laughs> that piece as I did and any other further questions. Go ahead, Torsten. Um, Steve Pollack w was um, such a strong kind of, he understood how to, he's the one who said that, the lesson of the flood is the strength of family. And um, I remember the first time we filmed those kids on horses as they were riding through Birch Creek. And, you know, so there's three generations later, you know, living in this river that, you know, had this very destructive force but is also a life force um, on that. It, water's a big deal down there. It's not, it's dry country. Um, and uh, that, there's that, that set of, uh, that footage, that scene of Omi in her, in her chair with her great grandchildren coming and that's the same thing. And we, we, we were trying to be very careful to not, as, as Ben said, we had to address what the flood was and the impact of it but we didn't want to be this to be a isn't kind of pointing a finger and saying hey look at this terrible thing that happened what was interesting to us was the response of the community which is really a story of resilience um, yeah. and whether butch who at the end of the film says i am blackfeet he asks the question at the beginning i came yeah. back to see if i could get still get that feeling like i am a blackfeet and then at the end he says i am blackfeet um, and Smokey, who when Eloise passes, the, 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 the ranch, you know, she's there. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the kids are there riding horses and playing in the river, you know, that, that sense of, of resilience and cultural continuance and all of that. Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah no. I, oh, go ahead, Sharon. No, no, please. Well, I, I, I'm struck often uh, with the strangeness of the idea that home is not a geographic place. It, it is the people who build that home around you. And um, without those people, those places can lose their meaning or we really struggle with what, that, what the meaning of those places are. And perhaps I'm speaking a bit from my own experiences, but you can go back to those places and if the community that you knew does not exist, it is not the same home. And, uh, you know, the injustices I think that have been visited upon the Blackfeet and many native communities are innumerable. But what we often miss in that is the incredible strength of family within some of those communities. And that was what Butch wanted. Butch, in, in my view, did not want Birch Creek. He wanted the family and the community of yeah. Birch Creek. And we also have to remember that this is a time uh, in the mid 20th century when the federal policy was, let's get native people off reservations and move them to urban communities. At, and, uh, you know, so then it comes to someone like Butch, why do you wanna go back? What keeps drawing you back to the reservation? Why don't you move to an urban area? Uh, because it's it this incredibly powerful sense of community uh, that I'm almost envious of, uh, it, it, well, I am envious of, um, you know, this real sense of belonging to a specific place. But we have to remember that the federal policy was to try to move people off these lands and integrate them into, uh, and, and that has the process of fraying that sense of community and, and family. Yeah, so just all, all the more, all the more, powerful you know that's that's that they um could could resist and and maintain oh i have a comment here the community response of flood bringing out the importance of family is so important so many reservations particularly in the upper midwest south dakota north dakota nebraska were flooded to drive the people out i was reminded of those stories when i watched that film very powerful yeah, thank you for that. So true. I, it's such a good point uh, regarding the flooding, this, this past, our past um, inequities with, with 
flooding. Well, well quite early. Oh, go ahead, Torsten. And the current, you know, water is it, even broader than flooding is water. That, that that's certainly a contemporary issue in many communities, including many native communities um, lately. Um, so, right. and to that point, uh, you know, that comment. Uh, one of the things that's scary um, about this kind of filmmaking is that there's there is no point where you become knowledgeable enough to kind of not be de uh, tender and and slow in how you move in this. I I don't know the history of floods on in native communities in general on this continent, and and yet here I am making a film about it. it, it uh, so it it. Uh, you know, I, I think I th when we lose our humility is maybe when we start doing really terrible things in, as storytellers. So uh, we're trying not to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the importance of, of water within not just this community, but so many communities. And, um, you know, that, that, that river, Birch Creek, was forever changed. Um, it, uh, and that forever changes the people when the water changes. And so areas where there used to be deep blue pools where you could fish for uh, trout, those have been uh, essentially graveled over. Um, bodies buried underneath the ground, um, homes uh, lost. Um, it, 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 it is not just a flood in, in the sense that the water rises and then it recedes. Uh, it is forever changed and, and the landscape, as you look out over the landscape from the top of where that dam now sits, you can see that it's still a half century later, looks like a construction site. Just the incredible force of this, of this water. We had, a, we had a, a number and I can't quite remember off the top of my head, but this little narrow creek bed had so many, uh, I, I believe it was maybe 15 to 20 times the volume of water traveling down it that day that the Mississippi River has. I mean, just an incredible force unleashed on these, on these communities. And, and once your water has changed in a community, you, your entire community has changed and transformed. Yeah, that's such a, that's such a good point. And I, I, but I have to say, I, um, I love the ending, I really loved and, and again, this is all, this is about water, but but how how Butch goes to Birch Creek and washes. I mean, I just that talk about a really incredibly strong visual. But he washes in Birch Creek. It's it's like he, you know, um, he washes away the the fear. Right, and he's no longer afraid of this of this creek. And um, and you know. And I think that's also goes back to the family, but and the community. But um, there was a real, and it was just really satisfying just to, um, you know, to see him able to find some sense of peace, you know, and um, and through that really visual way. I just could, I just, uh, I don't know, viewers, you probably. This probably resonated with you too, but it, his hands, you know, his big hands and and the the water, it was really just um, very, very symbolic and beautiful, I thought. You know, we uh, are still in touch with Butch from time to time. Really? I'm, on, I'm Facebook friends with him. Uh, <laughs> Not as often as we'd like. I, this is the first year in many that I haven't been back to Montana and it feels a little bit empty. Um, but who knows what Butch's story uh, holds going forward. And one of the difficult things we found about this film is you have to pick an endpoint. And our funders uh, at ITVS and Vision Maker said, you have to fit, you, you've got to pick an endpoint. <laughs> um, but our lives are, are, are not that neat and clean. And they don't just, uh, you know, reach this, this, this new equilibrium and everything is necessarily fine. Um, but we have to force that into a story somehow. And we just want to recognize that, that, yeah. that, that this is a moment. This is part of the arc of his life. And nothing but the best wishes 
for, for Butch on the rest of his journey. But the journey's not over for him. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, a little, a little over a year ago, as I drove, um, when we moved to this country, we moved to Minnesota. Because I think if you're Swedish, you have to move to Minnesota. But um, I now live in Oregon. So I drove, as I drove across um, to Minnesota in the summer, I stopped and visited with Smokey and her family, and then also with Butch. And uh, that was what struck me as well. It's like, oh, well, our film's over, but that has a little bearing on their life, really. That you know, they're, they're not. They, there was no kind of neat knot in their life. They just keep living their life. We could, we could probably go in and just keep making films about uh, what what they're doing. One of, one of the the real value. Uh, things we really cherish about this project is that it's being taught in schools now on those in those communities um, that they've developed curriculum around this and um, that it doesn't exist as just sort of this once in a year celebration that nobody really remembers what it's about that these stories are living and that kids are learning about them um, and to, to us that you know in, in into this community sharing those stories um, with the next generation is so important. We, we've done several screenings in the community and around the community since it came out. And on one of them was in the schools just before the school year. Um, it's in late, uh, I guess it's about this time of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was fun. It was in the school gym, you know, not, mm -hmm. uh, not a high tech theater or anything. It was just in a school gym on a big, screen and it it uh, for me as a filmmaker is nerve-wracking to in some ways because you think well i wonder what mistakes i've made i wonder what which of my misunderstandings are going to come out loud and clear and people are going to look at me and think who is this guy and who let him into our community mm -hmm. um, that's not what happened i think it, it may have happened but people are too polite to point it out if it did but there was quite a response uh, i think in each of the showings we've had um, and one of the responses, I had brought two DVDs and two Blu-rays um, and then a hard drive with the film on it because I was so nervous because I didn't know exactly what technology we would be using. And I was afraid that I'd be standing in front of a room full of people with a screen that had no images on it. Um, so I came over prepared and the superintendent came over after we had, of, of, of the schools in Hart Butte, which is the nearest community to the Birch Creek. And he said, um, do you have some copies of that? And I said, yeah. And I showed it to him. <laughs> he just, he just took them <laughs> and off they went. And uh, they used them the next week as part of their teacher training to teach the, for new teachers who, to teach the history of area. And they're showing them in classes now. And that, that was um, every showing of this, whether it's festival or broadcast is gratifying to us, but that one had us kind of a special level of gratification because it it felt like there was something it, it, in a small way there was something we could return to the community um and so, so that felt good that's, that's and, great and, and and you know that that again goes back to the, all the people in the organizations it takes to make a film like this it, mm -hmm. is we're part of that um so that felt that felt nice great. And from Danielle, I have a thank you to Vision Maker Media and all the filmmakers for bringing forth these stories. For this and Torsten, Torsten's kayak films, again, I applaud the patience utilized in creating these projects, letting the story and relationships develop. Um, it speaks to the fact that sometimes progress is slow, which is a good lesson for perseverance we all need. Great job in intercutting with rapid shots to give a sense of power and destruction of the floodwaters. I wonder if part of the reason that this tragedy and others isn't discussed much is that it is shared tragedy, which could be quite cultural due to the historical and ongoing genocide. It may seem hard to complain or seek help when it's something everyone around you has gone through. Thank you for being listeners to these people to help in the healing. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah, I think that's a really astute point, the, the fact that it affected so many people in these cultures, in this, in this community, particularly people on the southern half of the reservation, that it was just sort of embedded in their lives 
um, for so long and, and um, it's, it's shaped some of those interactions. One thing that's difficult to get, uh, get across is uh, how much humor was used to approach this topic, not by us, but uh, by people within those communities. Uh, humor as a, as a shield for trauma and tragedy. Um, and uh, it's, it's strange to say when you're making a film about this that you, you met people and you, you laughed deeply with them, not about this situation, but that it, it was part of um, kind of a, 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 um, a way to deal with this, with this trauma. And we saw that often. Um, and so I think that's really, it's really true when it's so, such a shared experience across the community, who is the one who sort of uh, broaches it as a topic that, that we should talk about. And um, I think that's uh, why we were able to have some access because we didn't know anything about it. And again, our ignorance was, was a gift and we could ask questions that everyone else, but, but I would also say that there were, uh, members of the community, Leilani, who grew up there during this time period, um, just doesn't remember anyone talking about this. So it was like a, a generational cultural tragedy, uh, and I and it didn't seem to be moving to the next generation for whatever reason that was. Yeah, I mean, it seems like one of the was it a cousin of Butch who said that the memory is dimming. I thought mm -hmm. that was. Well said, and yeah. yeah. Uh, Gayatri says, I lived through the 100-year-old war of the Red River in 1995 in North Dakota. It really is something enormously frightening to see a river crest and break the levees and submerge your entire town. It is enormously sobering to watch your entire material life kind of float away. The film captures that feeling of human helplessness very well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. thank you for that comment. Uh, we can't imagine it. Uh, and we struggled with the imagery that people were describing to us. Uh, and someone mentioned it, it felt apocalyptic. Um, and we really struggled to, you know, how do you, how do you bring this story back when it, it is so dramatic that it, it wouldn't even seem possible. Um, the, 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 you know, a 40 foot wall of water coming crashing down on you. It just doesn't seem, it seems like something out of Hollywood. Um, and so to try to capture that and um, was, was something we really struggled with. Anyone else? We've got just a few more minutes. Does, does anyone have any other comments? Those are really thoughtful. Uh, things that you've been sharing with us and if anyone has anything else or questions for our producer directors please let us know. Sharon I'd also say that um, we do have a Facebook page um, mm -hmm. with I don't know a thousand fifteen hundred two thousand I can't remember how many people are in that group um, and I would encourage people to go there. Some people share their stories there. Um, it's been really a valuable way for us to interact and get feedback from the community. Um, that process of community engagement also helped us unearth some of the old uh, eight mil millimeter film uh, that we were able to use and incorporate. Um, and so it's, it's really enormously gratifying to us to have community talking back to us and speaking to us and, and guiding us. Um, so it's, it's really a pleasure to get to chat with people here. Okay, and I, I assume that's um, the title of the film and is your Facebook page? Uh, the the um, name of the page is The 64 Flood. 64 Flood, uh, okay. So. Thank you, great. And, Kelsey says, uh, could you talk a little more about the process of shifting the project from oral history to a film? Well, I, I think for me, I, I'll be interested to hear how Ben answer this. For, for me, it was meeting Butch 
when um, when when he said, "I," we asked him, "Why did you come back?" We met we met Butch. Butch is a very charismatic and engaging guy, and and when he said, when we asked him, "Why did you come back after all these years?" He said, "I came back to see if I could still get that feeling like I was a Blackfeet." That was an opportunity to do present, to do present tense storytelling. Uh, all of a sudden, it became a now story and not a in the past story. That's when, to me, it became something that could become a film or something like that. That gave us that entree to to follow Butch through the process and um, to see if he could, in fact, sort of find himself or find his roots again. Um, but yeah, just the collection of oral histories are incredibly valuable, but it's tough to find a narrative that makes sense um, until we can we can see it sort of brought to life and we can watch somebody live it and experience it. Um, and so, yeah, which was a, was the turning point for us. B Butch is really fun to be around. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was it, he. It, we it, it, I, we kind of fell in love with him because of it. and and smoking or you know Eloise England's family too because it's such uh, you you walk in and the the love and kind of the the connectedness of that family it. it uh, it's very hard to go there and not eat a meal, for example. And it's, um, it's, it's so, so I don't, I, we didn't make a film so that we could hang out with them more. We could have done that anyways, but it, it, it was one of the many pleasant side effects uh, of wanting to do this film. Side effects, that wasn't the right word. Consequence. We'll say one of, the, one of the bonuses of making this film was getting to spend time with and and you said Butch is um, Butch stays in touch on Facebook too, so is he? Butch is, Butch is on Facebook, which is one of one of the technological marvels of my life, uh, <laughs> because when we met Butch, he was just out in the middle of nowhere, um, Montana, at the at the foot of the of Heart Butte Mountain, um, one of the most remote places in in the lower forty eight states. Um, and so the fact that he's uh, on Facebook and able to connect with us that way, I mean, uh, he wasn't always an easy person to track down, um, particularly if he didn't want to be bothered on a certain day. Then he became very, very difficult to find. Um, and there were days when he, he didn't want to be found. But um, so he is on Facebook at, with us. And, um, and uh, so that's, that's one of the marvels of modern technology. Yeah. Good. That's good. Good. Well, just a few more minutes. Anybody with any dying last questions? Or anything else either of you care to uh, care to close with? Well, I, I think that I um, I think it was Danielle who said that, you know, was talking about the the slow pace of this and all that. And it is it's that's a difficult thing to do. I think Ben and I can do it because we're both professors at universities, so we don't have to crank out films to make a living. Um, but it also, I think, speaks to the people who, the, the organizations behind us, again, Vision Maker and ITVS and Humanities Montana, who were willing to not think that we were screwing around, but that it really it really was a process that needed this kind of time. And I, you know, if, if we'd been pushed, well, there were many ways we were pushed and could have been pushed harder, I think, because we had, we had a lot to learn about filmmaking. But as far as the, the timeline of this, um, that again, it goes, so I was a newspaper photographer for decades. And that is very much, you're often alone and solving problems on your but filmmaking is such a team sport, and uh, um, it, the the team was really important. So it, so it wasn't just that Ben and I were patient; it was that the whole the whole package was full of people who understood the importance of letting this happen in the right way. Wonderful.
And um, yeah, just uh, thank you to Vision Maker and ITVS and Humanities Montana and all those community members, because really films like this can't be made if you're looking to take people's stories and just profit off them. And so it is such a relief to us to have an outlet like public television or um, uh, foundations who are willing to say, you know, take the time and get the story right. Um, because we, that's the only way that, that, that we want to work. Um, I think the other thing that we'd say is, unfortunately, Leilani couldn't join us today. Um, but it was so important to have Leilani as a member of our team and Brooke and George, um, because we were constantly needing their help to keep us um, uh, advised. And there are, there's, there's just a growing body of uh, native filmmakers out there, editors, and um, uh, that, that that was so much a key part of us trying to tell this story. We need more, uh, and we need them telling all sorts of stories. Um, but uh, we also think that it's that there's a place for uh, filmmakers to tell stories about people who aren't exactly like them, and um, to try to help us understand uh, each other. And so we're just really appreciative of all the, the help we received along the way and uh, humbled by the way um, people rallied around this story to, to help make it. And, and um, I don't know if we're out of time, but, it, but the idea that one of the things, because we're both teachers at universities, we did bring a number of young people with us in the field, several of whom are native. And because I think one of the answers to the fact that there are not enough native stories being told or, or any kind of story being told by native filmmakers, I, I don't think the answer is necessarily for us to stop making films, but one of the ways we can help that is to, to be people who promote young native filmmakers and help make this kind of storytelling welcoming to um, as the native filmmakers, yeah. Thank you for that. And, and Randy asked about some future films and maybe other films that you've worked on. And maybe Randy, I could just tell you too, that these two gentlemen have, uh, are both affiliated with universities. Just Google their names. You'll find lots more information about them or perhaps the Facebook page or if either of you want to connect in, uh, in another way. He says he sure will and, and to thank you. So. I just want to thank you once again for your time today. I really appreciated knowing sort of the back background of the, the story and, and your roles, your tremendous roles in this. And I want to thank all our viewers. Thank you so much for being with us today. And if you have not seen this film, you must see it again. If you've seen it, watch it a second time. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Have a great thank rest you, of sir. your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.